What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to yet another fantastic Nextiva webinar. Today, I don't even know if this guest needs a proper introduction. He is phenomenal in every way. The one and only Brian Solis. Welcome, Brian, to the Crabcast. Awesome to have you. Hey, thank you and the team at Nextiva for uh, for having me. I'm coming at you from Lake Tahoe, where it is actually snowing outside and it is uh, it's just incredibly beautiful and very humbled and appreciative to have this platform to not only work with you uh, and the next diva team but also to have everyone who's joined us today uh, be part of a, a, what I think is a very important discussion. Uh, I'll li let you set the stage and then uh, I'll jump in when you're ready. All right. Awesome. So uh, I want to shout out some people that are on the webinar today. We have a lot of people in the sidebar. Uh, what is up? Sabrina, Lee, Eric, KJ, Frank Fuentes. What's up, man? Uh, Susie, Mark, uh, Zev, Linda, Matt. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining the webinar. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Hey, what is up, Frank? A couple of housekeeping rules. So um, the next Eva team bought... Um, many copies of Brian Solis's new book, Life Scale, How to Live a More Creative, Productive, and Happy Life. I'm, I'm really pleased to say that uh, after this webinar, we are going to send you a free digital copy of Brian Solis's book. So be on the lookout for that in your email. And also, we are going to send the live replay of today's webinar. So if you missed anything, no need to worry, no need to panic. You're going to get a live replay link so you can watch this over and over again. There's also a uh, call to action button at the bottom of your screen. You'll see connect with Brian Solis. And if you click that, you can go to his uh, his site there. Uh, it's one of his sites. It's lifescaling.me. And then, of course, his, his, his uh, go-to um, master website is briansolis.com, where you can learn more about Brian and all the things he's up to there. Um, but with that being said, guys, let's let's pass it over to Brian. He's going to break down kind of all these problems that we're facing with digital distraction now again uh, in this day and age. You know, one thing I posted about yesterday was, and Brian, you know this all too well, you know, you get in this hamster digital hamster wheel of you check your email, you check your text messages, you check your voicemails, you check your project management tool, you check Slack, you check all these things, you check your CRM. Uh, before you know it, you're in this hamster wheel of, oh my God, I just spent an hour and a half, two hours checking stuff. Uh, social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp. And before you know it, you two hours have gone by and you've got nothing done. And now you have more messages <laughs> at the top of that cycle. And you can either go back to the top of the hamster wheel or you can figure out how to break the chains of digital distraction and actually be productive. So um, that's kind of the stage I'm, I'm looking to set uh, today. Uh, so, Brian, with that being said, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, man, and, and let you kind of break this down for our audience today. This is going to be awesome. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think you were saying something, but I was distracted just paying attention to my phone. <laughs> I'm, kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. Well, let me throw um, let me throw the screen out there for everybody, uh, cool. and we'll jump into the splendor that is PowerPoint. Uh, yeah. How are we looking on there? Can you see? Uh, can you see it? Yep. Looks fantastic. Excellent. All right, everybody. Well, I'm going to walk you through some of the thoughts um, and ideas and, and also lessons uh, of what living on this digital hamster wheel uh, looks and feels like. Uh, part of it is, is to build awareness. Uh, and then the other part is to kind of work together to go on a journey where we give ourselves a new, a new sense of purpose, uh, a new vision for taking control of all this stuff and not getting rid of tech, but managing it in a way that works for us and also for those uh, that we work with and also for our loved ones as well. Uh, this, this is a movement that I call life scaling. And the reason why I feel it's important is because I think at some point we were given access to tools uh, and platforms and devices that no one prepared us for, not our parents, not our teachers, not our managers, not our mentors. Uh, so we were left to sort of fend for ourselves. And the challenge I have is trying to promote a book with a positive message and, and a really useful uh, methodology to help us for the future when we don't necessarily know that we're distracted. We might feel like we're on this hamster wheel, but nothing changes. You're gonna go to bed, looking at your phone and you're going to wake up looking at your phone and you're going to go through this the same routines every single day until you decide to break it 
So where I wanted to start was on a positive note. I think that when you are happy with where you are and what you have, you are where you should be with what you already possess. I think that what I found out the hard way and what I want to share with you today is that life and happiness are part of the same journey. And it's there for us to enjoy every moment, to be in that moment, not by what's on your device, but to give someone and something your full attention, your full being, your full capacity, uh, because there's an energy in that. There's, there's splendor in that. There's magic in it because happiness already exists. It's already within you. Uh, and, you know, I'll tell you, honestly, at some point when I was writing what would have been my eighth book, uh, I, I hit a wall. I couldn't get past the proposal stage. And I didn't necessarily know why I couldn't get past the proposal stage. All I knew is that I needed to get that book out. And without that book, I was going to have a really difficult time uh, trying to push my my whole career, my whole platform, which is basically speaking and uh, developing thought leadership pieces and, 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 and research. And if I wasn't going to be able to get that book out, I wasn't necessarily going to have the platform I needed to continue on the, the path I was I was on. So it took everything I had to be able to focus on what I felt I needed to get to the bottom of, which was why couldn't I get that proposal done? Why, why couldn't I think the way I used to? Why couldn't I focus or, or concentrate for the, the time that I, I needed, like the time I used to be able to d- dive deep and be as cr- to be to ignite my imagination and creativity on, on, on demand. You know, and I started asking questions like, you know, when did we get so busy? When did looking at our devices get so normalized? When did it get so difficult to just think or even breathe? When did it become such such a responsibility, so much pressure to share everything that I'm doing and to feel like I need you to know that I see everything that you're doing? When did this anxiety just take over? These are questions that I didn't have answers to when I started to ask them. And the more research I did, the more just crazy things I found. The hard part was just recognizing, though, that without questioning any of those things, we're living life anxious, uh, more self-interested, less patient, uh, definitely more stressed. uh, But we do nothing about it. We tell ourselves that this is fine, that everything is fine. It's the ignorance is bliss. <laughs> thing. I mean, I'm sure there's people on this webinar right now, not giving you your, you know, their full and undivided attention. I mean, there's people in the comments right now saying that, you know, it's that fear of missing out trap. Ooh, what did my friend post on social media? Ooh, what's this happening? Oh, my inbox. Like they can't get rid of that fear of missing out anxiety. Like you mentioned, Brian. Yeah, man. And and that's I think that's the that's the challenge, right? I mean, ironically, there's there's folks multitasking because that's what we do. We're wired to do that. Uh, and I uh, based on your point, you know, I used to say that ignorance is bliss until it's not. And that was that was my life. Right. It wasn't bliss anymore when I failed to deliver that book and my whole world was starting to implode. Uh, the gift of awareness is a gift that we first give ourselves. And then I believe we give it to everyone else. Uh, in fact, what are the FOMO? Uh, plays on that I have is finally over missing out where I'm where I want to be and I'm doing what I want to be doing. And right now that's, that's with you. Although ironically, I'm going to retweet next Diva's tweet to say to, to join us. And now that's the last of my multitasking. Uh, But, you know, times are changing. You know, our grandparents passed down to our parents and there our great grandparents passed down to them what life was like how we're supposed to live, what normal looked like, what success and happiness look like. And I question as to whether those things work the way that they used to without someone that we believe knows us and knows what we're contending with, unless we believe that someone can guide us in a, in a way that is going to be much more productive and advantageous to us to help us redefine what success and happiness looks like. And that's what I wanted to share with you is this journey I went on to kind of get to the bottom of a lot of things that were elusive or missing in my life without me even realizing it, that I was 
normalizing the wrong things, that I was prioritizing and, and, and worshiping the wrong things, that I was confusing abundance with happiness and not necessarily realizing that the things that I needed right now were in this moment in order to take from them what I needed to grow in ways that were going to be advantageous to myself and those around me. And if you think about this, this drawing that I'm sharing with you that uh, a friend of mine, uh, Hugh McLeod, drew for me, uh, you know, when you're in the moment, it's natural to want to just share it and you know, essentially multitask, which makes it impossible to actually be in that moment and to enjoy that moment and take from it of which would make you a better person or a more whole person or a more fulfilled person. I think about what Maslow's hierarchy of needs used to be, uh, and they're still important, but think about this, the fact that something like this is going to be all consuming and taking over your whole world, that you think about where your device is, that it's always within arm's reach, that if it dies or if, if it's not connected, that you're not connected. If you think about all of the platforms and services that you use behind the scenes, it's they're, they're having conversations that would blow your mind as to how they're trying to capture your attention. And this is a, this is a real quote that Reed Hastings said in a shareholder conference last year. Attention is a currency. They have it. They have your attention. And the more they have your attention, the more they can monetize it. This is true for every single platform that we use. If you think about how you use digital today, you're essentially rewiring your brain and your body. This is stuff I didn't know until I really started to research what was going on. And not being able to finish a book proposal was the least of my worries. Uh, and I want to share with you some of the highlights of that research so that we could build a path forward together. On average, we receive about 200 notifications per day whether that's social, whether that's email, whether that's Slack. Uh, but what happens is it's all the same. When it pulls your attention away from something you're doing, it's teaching your brain to be ready to be distracted. It's teaching your brain to speed up. It's teaching your the chemicals in your body to, to help you feel like you're in control. But at the same time, those chemicals are making you feel stress and anxiety. Uh, they're also fooling you into believing that you're in demand, that you're at top of mind, that you're wanted, that you're plugged in, keeps you from feeling FOMO. But at the same time, we welcome these distractions because maybe it helps us not having to contend with some a difficult task, like, for example, a book proposal, or writing a book, uh, or creating the next big thing. But it also helps us from seemingly feeling less lonely or feeling fear or indulging self-doubt or self-loathing or insecurity. Yet, ironically, the more we try to prevent that, uh, the more that we try to get caught up in these moments and these networks and these communities, the more we actually do feel loneliness, self-doubt, self-loathing and insecurity. In fact, we're, learning to expect this regular interruption to the point where it becomes normal. So everything about us changes to keep up with that. And it comes at a cost of being able to slow down, to feel, to express contentment, feel contentment. This is a video that's uh, on Instagram that shows a, a inebriated woman sitting at a bar, essentially scrolling a pack of cigarettes because her muscle memory thinks it's a phone and therefore it's acting like it is a phone. That's uh, that's unbelievable. You, you know that Facebook <laughs> that Facebook example is really powerful. I saw kind of a behind the scenes of how Facebook's user experience designers think about the platform. And one analogy that, that came out of the discussion was they wanted to build it similar to, to how um, gaming, gaming machines work in casinos. Yep. It's called variable intermittent rewards. Exactly. It gives you the sensation that you win uh, when you get a mm -hmm. notification, when you get an update, uh, when you do not get an update, 
or a notification uh, or a new follower, you don't feel like you win. You feel like you're losing. And that actually starts to accelerate the negative emotions like loneliness or self-loathing or self-doubt. Uh, it's, it's self-esteem goes down. Uh, it's in fact, there's a, there's a powerful quote that says something like they were given, they designed with the power of the gods, but without their wisdom. And, uh, this is, this is highly, uh, in contention. Uh, it's also called persuasive design. These are techniques that aren't just used in gambling. It's also used in psychological warfare. It's also used in spreading fake news. It's, uh, it's a powerful form of manipulation that, you know, nobody necessarily understands that that's what's happening behind the scenes. There's Tristan Harris is one of those whistleblowers that was probably in the documentary you saw. Uh, he is a, is a very well-known designer prolific for at the, at the, in the least. Uh, he started a thing, uh, an organization called the center for humane technology, which is trying to bring about ethical design. The, the thing about ethical design is that, the more that they manipulate your attention, the more that they make you addicted to the platforms, the more that they make you use the platforms, that, that's how they generate revenue. And then unfortunately, they're in the business of, of generating revenue. So I think a lot of this awareness has to not just go to the design, uh, design ethics, but also has to go to us as individuals to take control of how we spend our experiences. I'm not asking you to turn any of these things off. I'm just asking all of us to be more mindful so that it's, 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 positive for us and what we do in this world online and offline. Because if you think about it, every platform you use is absolutely changing your behavior. And I would argue that it's not necessarily for the better, right? So we're turning conversations into moments. We're stripping away the depth and critical thinking. We're, we're tearing away empathy. It's, you might feel something in a moment, but five minutes from now, you're going to move on to the next thing. Uh, you think about the fact that a lot of these platforms are polarizing relationships. Uh, you think about these platforms stealing your time. Uh, you know, they, they call it going down the rabbit hole for a reason. Uh, in fact, uh, I often joke that, you know, when I, and because it's true, it's funny, I go into YouTube to find a certain video uh, or something in terms of research and find myself 30 minutes later of watching the most random of things. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what, and it's something I think we can all relate to. But yeah. the, the reality is, is behind the scenes, you know, it's getting harder to disconnect. It's increasing our stress and anxiety. We're actually getting less sleep. Blue light, we're just starting to understand the effects of blue light on even our retinas, not even just our brains and bodies, right? I mean, it's just it's just the, the, the full health and wellness effects of all of this stuff. But yeah, I think there's a know. lot of danger with that polarizing relationships example you, you, you talked about. I mean, I see this with, you know, even some members of my own family where, you know, they're those older members of my family. Uh, they're new to Facebook, but this is a new phenomenon. They're addicted to it. And, you know, when they post, you know, for example, political things. And whenever mm -hmm. something comes along in their feed that they don't agree with, they block it out or they negate it or, you know, they, 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 they they aren't able to see the other point of view and they only see what others are agreeing with, uh, with regards to their own point of view. So it becomes this very toxic cycle of kind of eating your own dog food, where you're surrounded by people in this digital bubble that only believe and think and, and see the world the way you see it. And then when someone comes along with an opposing viewpoint, you know, it's, it's hellfire and brimstone because you're not able to see that that polarity because of of the the way that the algorithm is kind of shaping your your digital experience yeah absolutely and, and in fact there's a i think i was putting it in uh, it was in this presentation but i yanked it out i talked a little bit about how uh you know the social media social media i often say social media the great thing about it is that it gave us a voice the bad thing about social media is that it gave us a voice and the uh you know, the thing that it led to was while it democratized relationships and information and influence, it also uh, had the the adverse effect of strengthening cognitive biases and making some of our networks less expansive and more insular in that we tend to surround ourselves with people who validate the thinking that we already have. And everything about your networks and the people that you're surrounded with basically reinforce the fact that you're right. But you, you, you can't you can't think critically. You can't analyze yourself through scenarios if if you don't believe you have anything to learn or unlearn yet regardless of the polarization of relationships the fact is is that 
every aspect of our life is starting to fall apart and we don't necessarily realize it yet because these tools, I, I don't know that they were, I would, I would say that even though they were designed with the intentionality of making them addictive and, and also making them sticky, I guess is probably a, a polite way to put it, but also essentially occupying and, and manipulating your attention span. Uh, you know, no one did the long-term research uh, on on these things, uh, and it's going to get worse. Uh, this is uh, a, a startup founder uh, who's very well known and respected in the industry. Uh, but if you read what he said in a in a recent interview, they're using AI and neuroscience to actually make these things more addictive. Uh, that they're designing minds. They're trying to figure out, and this, these are his words, how to juice people. So we're kind of getting thrown into this without, without the luxury, without the advantage of awareness and education, yet we still, we still have to make decisions that are for our best interests, for our children, for their education. And you think e about, even the title of that, of that company, by the way, Dopamine Labs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that doesn't tell you all you need to know right there that I don't know. <laughs> that's exactly that's, right. That's I mean, hilarious. It, uh, dopamine is just one of the six common chemicals that your body releases in a lot of these things. And it's, um, well, I mean, I guess it's a perfect segue right here is that uh, it's like cigarettes. It's like any drug, really. Uh, your body becomes addicted to how you feel because how you feel is the result of the chemicals and, and the sensations that they swirl around in your bodies. But like cigarettes, you know, doctors used to promote cigarettes back in the, in the 50s and 60s. And today we now know the adverse health effects. People still smoke, but I think they do so now, you know, at least I'll give them the credit of doing so mindfully. But Look, our attention is traded as a commodity. They're looking for ways to quote unquote juice us and to grab more of that attention. Uh, and look, that stuff comes at a cost. Uh, and that means that we have to take a minute to define what's in our best interest, both online and offline. And that takes a moment of just breathing it in and, and breathing it out and giving yourself more moments like this so that you can think critically about the intentionality of what you want to do and where you want to be and why. And so to your point earlier about ignorance is bliss, I, um, I also believe that it's, uh, if that's the case and awareness can be awakening and that's, and that's where I think the life scale journey can take us. Uh, there has to be a power, a superpower given to ourselves in first allowing or giving ourselves permission in allowing us to consider these as life options, but more importantly, the superpower of giving ourselves the ability to be smart about what's actually happening uh, so that we can be mindful and wise in the choices that we make. Because there's a conscious system uh, and an unconscious network that kind of go into our operating modes every single day. And dopamine labs, for example, is designing for our unconscious network uh, because it's very vulnerable to distractions. Uh, we can be very mindful and intent about not being distracted, but you know when you feel that urge to reach for your phone to see what's happening, that FOMO that you feel, that's, that's the unconscious network in play. In fact, it's so, it's so critical that our children, we're, we, you know, we thrust a, a tablet or a phone in their hands to keep them engaged while we have dinner or while we shop at the market or whatever it is, and yet we're rewiring their brains and their bodies <laughs> in ways that are essentially setting them up to fail, right? Because they have to go to school, they have to eventually go to work in, in essentially environments that were designed you know, when, when cigarettes were, were new, uh, <laughs> at least the commercialization of them. Uh, and so those environments, just like what we're experiencing every single day, are dated and the, they don't necessarily coalesce well. Uh, in fact, there, there are bigger than ethical issues in, associated with all of these things. But also, there's the, the mindlessness that, that go into this that have effects and consequences that we might not think about. I mean, this is a picture we've probably all taken. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably continue to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's demonstrating to the, our friends in the most, I, I want to say, in the most um, innocent way possible that we're just trying to show that we're living our best life. But it's also, uh, it's also called social reaching. So essentially, it comes at a cost. 
right? So what we're telling someone else is that their life isn't good enough uh, because that's certainly what people feel. Uh, whether they know it or not, a lot of times the anxiety that they carry and the self-esteem issues that they, they feel are because they don't feel like they measure up to their friends uh, and to what they see online. And that's, that's part of the challenge. And it also ultimately you know, gets, gets you to where I was, which was mm. an incredible loss of productivity, um, the incredible loss of creativity, and, and ultimately just loss of happiness. No. Dude, that's, that's so powerful. Um, I, you know, me and my friends, whenever we go out to dinner, uh, we play this, we play this, uh, this game where we, we all put our phones in the middle of the table. First person to reach for their phone has to pick up the check. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. You'd be surprised by like the third time around. That's when people start. Re- oh, no, I'm not going to do it this time. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and look, I, I think, yeah, it's a fun. I think that's a fun game to play. And at the same time, it's it's. I always say that the the hardest thing about common sense is that it's incredibly uncommon. Is that it's not, you know, I I don't know about your friends, but I I've, I've seen with my friends in in similar environments. It's not that they connect the dots that technology is actually bad. It's that they don't want to pay the bill. And the the reality is is that productivity, happiness, and creativity. Uh, are all interlinked. Whether you're not productive or happy or creative, or you are, they're all interlinked. Uh, and so your work, home, school, your side hustle, your relationships, my goodness, your relationships, all of these things are the direct result of the combination of productivity, happiness, and creative. And that and that has to come down to things about being mindful, present, aware, having a purpose, having a vision of where you want to go. Uh, you know, that you have to realize that we, everything is not fine. You are not living your best life, even though you give the appearance that you are, that the biggest direct link of all of this stuff is dwindling imagination and thinking critically and just creativity in general. Every single aspect of distraction isn't just about social media or your alerts. It's also how you live life, right? I mean, just think about how many tabs you probably have open on your browser at any given point. Uh, and that is a, that's a symbol of not being able to make decisions and close out projects, that you have all of these things open because you mean to get to them at some point. You feel like you're, you're maybe managing them all together, but you're not. It's actually... Uh, psychologically this is called a cognitive load that you carry and and health wise and wellness wise this essentially depletes your resources it's not it's not unlike your computer when you have all of these browsers open it's de- diminishing your system resources it's actually giving you less processing power to do other things and so the same is true for your life the same is true for how you lose control of how you work and all of the aspects of organizing your life. Uh, These are all cognitive loads and it spills into every aspect of it. So it's not just about using tools to become more productive. It's actually putting your attention into line in where things need to go and why. Uh, Because these- That desktop picture (laughs) gave me anxiety (laughs) just looking at it. (laughs) Um, by the way, Brian, I, I started using the tab limiter on, on Chrome and I, I limit myself actually to five tabs maximum at once. I don't know if you would recommend that, but that's something I've been trying and it's been helping. Hey, I think anything that, especially that's intentional, right? So anything that you can do, um, with this, uh, any tool that you use to, to mindfully limit that, it's fantastic. And, you know, as long as we, we all realize that the goal is actually to limit yourself to what you need in order to get that task done, because otherwise it comes at an incredible opportunity cost, right? So think about this, that the U.S. workforce spends about two hours or more checking their smartphone at work every day. Uh, and that's about 10 hours a week. It's about 40 point something hours per month. That's a lot of time taken away from the stuff you're getting paid to do, right? So that ultimately comes at an incredible cost to the organization that you work for. And then ultimately, the output of your own work is affected by that as well. Uh, We're shifting attention all the time now, right? It started with 
the days of email and notifications, you know, that's been 20 years, but now the smartphone has been in our hands. Gosh, what the app, the iPhone came out 11, 12 years ago. Uh, so this is, this is all starting to, to add up. And every time you reach for that device, especially if you're in the middle of a task, it takes you over 23 minutes to get back into the zone of where you were before you reach for that, that device or, or that distraction. So, the quality and the caliber of your work, not even just the creativity, but your output is affected. It takes you longer to do things. It might not necessarily be as as brilliant as it could have been otherwise. And look, I, I only know this is because I found that I was confusing the output of work as the as the check, right? Checking it off my to-do list was was the accomplishment, not not the caliber of it. But as neuroscience is starting to show, is that every time you multitask, you're not actually doing multiple things at once you're literally switching in between things and you're using up precious nutrients in the brain and the body to be able to do this this is why you're speeding things up and why you feel anxiety and why the caliber of your work isn't what it could really be uh, and if you look at this over time the the effects are incredibly corrosive right and we're just starting to learn this so again it's not just social media and devices it's just all of the things memory especially your short-term memory and you could see this happen all the time when you try to think of the name of that book or that song or that actor uh, and then you have to google it right so you teach yourself not to even think or activate those those pathways you're just kind of taking the easy way out and over time these things just diminish creativity but it lowers your IQ. It, it hurts your relationship. It damages your brain. <laughs> and I, I even think t to a degree, it's a societal kind of false glorification of, of multitasking as a concept that, you know, it's kind of a badge of honor. Oh, look how many things I can do. I'm, I'm a great multitasker that even, you even see that sometimes on resumes, like great multitasker. Like oh, I don't want a great <laughs> multitasker. I want somebody who can single task and, you know, focus and get things done in a meaningful and impactful way. Kind of like you just mentioned, Brian, instead of, you know, multitasking leading to all these really corrosive uh, outcomes, it's, it's, it's really uh, eye opening. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. And, and I call it the cult of busy uh, or the glorification of hustle is that the busier you are, the more the more important it seems. But in reality, you're not actually getting things done to your full potentiality. Uh, so, you know, I one of the things that I did is I kept a scorecard of how many times I was getting distracted so I could see uh, beyond just your your digital wellness counters on your phones, for example, of which you know some people are used as also as a badge of honor. Uh, is to see exactly how much you pull yourself away from what you could actually be doing. Um, and if you really want to take control and you really want to be a leader and you want to lead by example, all of this can be solved by simply trying to control alt delete life to give yourself the means to pursue what a satisfying and fulfilling life could be. Uh, and that is having meaning uh, in your life uh, and the pursuit of that meaning. Um, and what I really want to clarify is that oftentimes I think we fall into what I call the happiness trap, where we think the pursuit of it is, is uh, what matters. I think the pursuit of meaning is what matters, uh, giving yourself purpose and working towards that purpose, but finding happiness in everything that you do along the way is actually the secret to happiness, uh, that you're not going to be happy when you get somewhere or you have something. It's not a, an accumulation of stuff. It's not vanity. It's just simply a way of life. And it's important to understand that it's a mindset. Right? You give yourself permission and you give yourself the power to feel happy even in the pursuit of other things. That if you're saving for something, if you're working towards something, it still means that you can be happy where you're at with what you have. Um, and I think a lot of that can be credited to creativity. Uh, and creativity is something I don't think we celebrate enough in life. And creativity is something that is actually what I believe we could use more of uh, especially in an era of AI and machine learning. And as it starts to automate the common tasks that we all felt were never going to affect the majority of workers. And now it's really starting to sh show signs.
that creativity is going to be the, the, the creativity and the arts are going to be the very thing that machines can't duplicate. And it gives us that individuality. There's an expression that I, I share often is that it's not disruption that you have to worry about. It's mediocrity. Um, because mediocrity is, is, is the result of all of these platforms that we're using because it gives us a semblance of being creative. I mean, think about Instagram and the filters that you use to make something look phenomenal. Think about the portrait settings on your iPhone that make anything you're taking a picture of look phenomenal. Think about all of the Instagrammable things that you see all over the place it's on a wall that you take a picture in front of because you feel that that expresses your individuality. This is all stuff that everybody is doing and that everybody has access to. But creativity is a natural part of human thinking. And in many of us, it's just been blocked and not stoked. When we were all children, we used to have the freedom of creativity and expression. Our work used to be hung on our parents' refrigerators. And at some point, we just moved much more to the logical and analytical ways of working, the linear ways of thinking, uh, being put essentially in the proverbial box. Um, there's a famous saying by Sir Ken Robinson that uh, we don't grow into creativity, we grow out of it, um, and rather we're, we're educated out of it. Um, That's so powerful. I, I, you know, I couldn't agree with this more. I, I wrote an article a while back um, called Why You Should Work Less and Spend More Time on Your Hobbies, kind of an ode to tapping back into your creativity to actually uh, catapult yourself to be more productive at work by taking these breaks and tapping back into, you know, that, that sort of passion that you may have that may be on the back burner, because like you said, Brian, we're so, we're so caught up in this, you know, react reactive mode that we, we don't get to tap into our creative, our creativity and our passions. So it's, it can, it can be quite detrimental. Yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, because at the heart of this is, is true individuality. Uh, and firing parts of your brain and your body that have just been repressed uh, or reprogrammed. Uh, and the world doesn't get to see that in you, right? Instead, we kind of fool ourselves into these forms of rapid e expression online uh, and rapid engagement online that, that that's, that's our contribution to the world, but it's not. Uh, in fact, Sir Ken Robinson describes creativity as original ideas that have value, and that's exactly what the world needs more of. Um, because creativity pushes you to take risks, right? And some of us are fear of judgment. Some of us fear uh, that we don't have the talent. Some of us fear that maybe artistry is for you know the, the brilliant minds of the world. But the truth is, is that even just just the acts of creativity uh, expand our thinking, uh, give us new skill sets, and give us new ways of of moving and thinking uh, that are truly unique. That are not in any way, shape, or form, mediocre. In fact, there's even some of the simplest exercises, uh, like trying to write a sentence with the opposite hand that you usually write with, uh, or walking backwards, or whatever, that the weirdest, silliest things that you could think of are actually healthy and beneficial for you because pushing you to take risks is actually what progress and advancement are all about. Because without creativity, there would be no innovation. And every aspect of how we work and how we think and how these devices are consuming us uh, are actually preventing us from being innovative. They're forcing us into this construct of behaviors and routines that make us feel so safe and secure that just the idea of breaking out of them is frightening uh, and keeps us frozen. Yet, the very definition of innovation is looking at how we can come up with new ideas that create new value. And you can't do that if you follow the normal routines and the normal processes. Uh, and the benefits of creativity as the antithesis to the, the, the effects of multitasking uh, and distractions, well, it's all the good things. It makes you feel great. It grows your mind. It makes you feel better. It stops time. It creates something with lasting meaning. It's a, it's a true social object in that it brings people together around something. Uh, it builds your self-confidence. It gives you a voice that other people just don't have. Uh, that direct path to happiness is actually through creativity, and it benefits not only you, but everyone. And 
I like to say that it's time to reacquaint yourself, reacquaint yourself with the artist formerly known as you because you were creative. In fact, there's a lot of new science that's out right now that's super, super exciting uh, in that uh, it shows that the less creative you are, the older you get, the, <laughs> the older you get, the faster uh, and older you get, uh, which is which is not uh, anything I looking, I'm looking forward to. But for example, in senior living communities, they're starting to teach uh, anything, piano, violin, dancing, uh, new languages. It's, so that expression about uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks is actually not true at all. Your brain can fire in new ways, no matter how old you are. Uh, and so they show that as you start to fire your brain in these new ways, you're essentially teaching it. And in that teaching, you're feeling younger. That is the secret. That is the fountain of youth. Because if you're not going to take care of your body and your mind, then who is? It's like a car. It's like anything that requires maintenance. At some point, it's going to fail you. We're not invincible. I wasn't invincible. Um, and the good news about this is that every night you go to sleep, you replenish those chemicals and those nutrients that you use up. And this is why sleep is so important, why Ariana Huffington, for example, is a big believer and big advocate uh, for sleep because it, it literally gives you a new day with new potential. Um, and some things before we go to Q&A that I'll just share with you at a high level is try to think about your day in ways where you can get the deeper work done distraction free at the beginning and save your afternoon. And once you've used up those nutrients and, and those chemicals, when you're feeling a little bit more depleted and a little less fresh and creative for other mundane tasks like email and maybe social media, you don't have to be on those things all day. I also suggest structuring your meetings that way. I know this, this comes to the dismay of many people who love to live their, their world and their life in meetings, but you know, those things should be at the end of the day as well. Uh, so that you save your time for that creative and that deep work that, uh, as we were talking about earlier, that uh, single tasking as a matter of ritual is actually the great work, uh, how great work is done. And the more great work that you do, uh, the more, uh, look, the more special you are, uh, because everybody can't be special if they're doing what everybody else is doing. Uh, and there, there are techniques that you can build to practice with uh, one of the ones that I started with at the beginning was the, what's called the Pomodoro timer, which asks you to focus for 25 minutes uh, in bursts, distraction-free, and then you take a five-minute break. And the first time I tried that, I think I, think I made it like three minutes uh, into it before <laughs> I reached for my phone. And, and I yeah. didn't have a notification. It was just muscle muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I love the Pomodoro technique. Uh, I find it a fantastic way to work. I I been trying that um probably for the past like year and it, it does work wonders um the other thing i've been doing brian is uh actually just keeping my phone completely away from me like when i'm working on 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 tasks and really trying to accomplish deep work i keep my phone charged in the other room on silent committing to myself that i will not be uh, tempted <laughs> to reach for it and, and start meddling around on social media. And then before you know it, I've totally lost my, my track and then I've got to get back on. And it's like, it's hard to get back on focus once you've, you know, distracted yourself. Yeah. You know, and on that note too, and some of the things I'm experimenting, experimenting with, it's not in the book, but, uh, taking the phone to bed is actually one of the worst things you can do as well. Uh, and I know that it's become the device that helps us even with something as simple as an alarm. But having that phone keeps that tether uh, that is essentially another cognitive load, like having multiple tabs open. Uh, so going old school, like having a dedicated alarm and putting your, putting your phone off uh, or keeping it in another room charging is actually going to give you some of the best sleep you've had in a, in a long time. Uh, and, and just kind of, coming back here and then I guess we'll get to um, your questions is, you know, there's a reason why we procrastinate. There's a lot of reasons why we procrastinate, but one of them is uh, subconsciously that we try to avoid unpleasant emotions uh, that might, we might associate with that task or that project at hand. And that's normal. And uh, as I was writing the book, I found this quote from Muhammad Ali that I, I felt was worth sharing with you because it's a shift in perspective. And he said that he hated every minute of training, uh, but he convinced himself that you can't quit. If you suffer now, 
when you go through those things now, he envisioned why he was doing those things, and that was to live life, the rest of his life as a champion. Uh, and so solving the problem is not about simple time management uh, or productivity tools or productivity hacks. It's, uh, it's actually changing how you perceive the task. So you're essentially envisioning the pleasure of completing it and what life looks like with it completed. Because if you can't visualize it, uh, you can't achieve it. Um, if you can't appreciate it, you can't learn and build upon those learnings. Uh, and that's, that's what we're talking about. This is about becoming more exceptional, becoming more creative, becoming happier, and becoming sort of that, that center of life for everyone else. Because the more you know who you are, the more you can become that ideal you, not that aspirational selfie that we, we commonly communicate on all of these platforms. Because you weren't put on this planet to validate your existence through the false validation of strangers. Uh, all of these things, all of the, all of your capabilities, all of your potential is actually locked up and repressed inside of you right now. We're just seeing a glimmer, a sliver of what you're capable of. I think we each need to find a new path and live our life as if no one is watching, because that's when true individuality and expression come through. And I'll leave you with this. This is an image I had done, uh, in celebration of the release of the book. It's not trying to become this aspirational selfie that makes other people feel less inferior in the process. It's actually just believing in yourself. Uh, and that's the most that each of us can really do because the more you believe in yourself and the more you know where you're going and why you're going in that direction, the more that that is you. Uh, and that is true uh, aspiration. Um, and that is true leadership. And that is inspiring what I hope everyone who's listening to uh, today to go on this life scale journey uh, and build your way up through not just creativity and happiness, but in a whole new you that teaches us and shows us what's possible when we can break free from the shackles of distraction uh, and this digital hamster wheel, uh, as we talked about earlier, and living a life that we still balance with tech, but living a life that is beautiful online and offline. So uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. I think we'll, uh, we'll throw it over to questions. Did that, that, that was awesome. And I love that, you know, that X at the end of the selfie <laughs> shorten it to self. I mean, I'm dude, I'll, I'll be honest with you, man. Like, you know, that whole presentation was phenomenal. And the one thing I just kept thinking about over and over again was like the younger generation, this, this younger generation um, that is just so obsessed with social media and selfies and digitally documenting every moment of their life, not being present. I mean, dude, we, we are <laughs> heading down a dark <laughs> path uh, with our youth. I just don't know like even where and how to start addressing it or tackling it. Like, I don't know. What are your thoughts on like the, the, the issues that we're facing gener generationally with this? You know, look, uh, I try, I try not to get, uh, I try not to get political. I'm a hopeless optimist, but I will say this is that, you know, right now, if you look at the United States, we're, we're on the verge of cutting more and more arts programs uh, out of our schools where uh, we're not celebrating or investing in our education systems in a way that are going to be able to address essentially what the same wall that I hit is the same wall that everybody's going to hit. It's just a matter of time. And I feel, I feel the most concerned for our students whose brains don't work in the way that any of these analog constructs uh, operate. And so I think we're failing them by not reimagining or allowing ourselves to be innovative in thinking about education uh, and also parenting, right? I think parents are also a big part of the problem because they don't necessarily, I'm not faulting them, but they don't, you know, they don't know the, the ramifications of, of tech, mm -hmm. but they need to, right? And like you said, mm -hmm. ignorance is bliss. And then, you know, until it's not, and that, we all need to have a role in voting people in who are going to do the right things for our, our, our education system, our kids, us. Uh, we, need, we need medical professionals. We need uh, health professionals and wellness professionals to be fully versed in everything that's happening. Can't just be me and some guy who failed to do certain things trying to create a book that's going to change our lives. I, know, I, I, hope to have, I hope to add a positive and value-added message to the story, but I'm just one person. I think we all need to take, take action. Yeah. Absolutely. 
All right, so we have a few questions. Uh, this is from Lee. Um, Lee says, Brian, do you have any creative endeavors, hobbies that are completely unrelated to and outside of your professional life? Uh, if so, what are those? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually you know, curious too. Uh, it's funny that you ask. So I grew up, uh, I grew up as as a musician. I, my parents put a, a guitar in my hand uh, when I was seven years old, and uh, I'll I'll share a picture. Um, I, there we go. That's me, uh, 10 years old, oh, playing, man. playing my first concert. Uh, and uh, I wrote music and uh, played in, in bands for a really long time, recorded music. Uh, I was a horrible singer, though, so I, uh, I, wrote, <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote music for other people to sing. I just played guitar and, uh, and wrote, started to learn other instruments. And I, I put that all aside to, uh, you know, to, to do the job. Uh, mm -hmm. and that I missed that and I'm trying to bring that back, but I will say this for those who read my last book X and for those who do hold a copy of life scale, uh, you'll see that the, the level of creativity that I put, I actually designed, uh, these, well, actually the last three books, but life scale in particular is a very special design, uh, in that I wanted to show you that words were just one part of the artistry you know the visualization is also part of the narrative and it was very intentional uh, and that that expression was something that i didn't have to do i could have let the publisher just put a book together in a way that a book is normally put together but also just putting putting that artistry in all of its forms was i oh, just magical i felt alive i feel i feel more alive than ever and i don't i will be playing guitar again but i found other vices for that expression of creativity <laughs> Nice. I'm a, I'm a guitar player as well. So <clears throat> I relate to that quite a lot. Um, that's awesome. We'll jam time, in next, uh, Miami. Yeah, dude. Next time, man, we'll, we'll do a little, uh, little jam session. I've got plenty of electrics and acoustics right that we can rock out on, man. Um, we've got some more questions. Um, this one is from Sabrina. She said, uh, what should parents do in order to educate their kids about digital distractions today? Um, they're using social media now, but their work will most likely be negative impacted, negatively impacted when they're adults. Um, that's a good one. So that's from Sabrina. Yeah, Sabrina, uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to hear from you again. Uh, so I think that that awareness has to first start with parents uh, and adults. Um, you know, there, I think a lot of times I don't, I, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, I'm a parent. I don't, I don't think that we're making these decisions to be bad parents. I think that we're just kind of doing what we need to do because we're also so busy trying to work. Many of us are trying to get things done. We're also trying to all be great parents. Uh, and look, there's a, there's a little bit of laziness that comes with that device because it gives us a moment to breathe and to do other things that we need to do. But at the same time, we're also not the best role models. We look at our devices in, in front of them and we teach them just through our actions that that is... Uh, that that's okay. Uh, there are amazing tools on these devices uh, that can help help you focus, right? Uh, it's just helping our children understand, uh, number one, how they can build the skill sets necessary that digital devices are going to give them to operate both online and in the real world. And so that takes education on our part to understand what that is, not just for them, but also for ourselves. Um, but also, yeah, do you, you have to allow them to have the... Uh, the bad, the bad experiences too, um, because it teaches them what the boundaries are, but we have to be proactive in helping them set up those boundaries. Yeah. And there's Sabrina right there. I, I invited her to say hello real quick. <laughs> I hope that was good. I hope that answered your question. I hope you've enjoyed uh, Brian's presentation. Thank you. I love everything about Brian's presentations. We had the opportunity to meet at social media marketing world a few weeks ago. And I was in awe of everything that he said because he was talking to me. So I really enjoyed that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, have a great day, Sabrina. We just wanted to say hello and invite you up real quick. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. Enjoy your day. Okay. <laughs> Bye. That was awesome. I love Whoa. this platform. You were right. Dude, it's it's the best, man. Uh, we have one more question from Zev. Uh, I'm going to invite him up. He's He's got a really interesting question here, and I think this is uh, quite uh, common for, for many people. So he says, um, you know, right before he's about to go to bed, he's rotating through his feeds, and he's, you know, he's he's thinking about, like, what would a guy like Jocko Willink 
be saying, like, you know, have discipline and, you know, think about what these people like you and Jocko Willink are saying. Um, and, and then he says, does that suggest one should choose to be a tradesman over a social media personality or should you pursue your path as a tradesman? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one. What's up, Zev? Welcome well, to the yeah. webinar. Enjoy my kitchen here in the background. Um, <laughs> great, great webcast. I love what you guys did today. But it's seriously a good question in my mind for me to, to, to analyze for my kids. Do we want to gear them towards something less social media centric, like being influencer or being a vlogger blogger um, and get them away from that tech? Should we be training them, you know, get back in the trades or being an accountant or an attorney or a doctor? Because they all want to get into social media. That's what they want to do now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this is a this is a, I'm not going to lie. This is a hard one to answer, uh, and it comes it it comes with great contention from all sides. Uh, I think there's a I think the irony of answering this question as someone who uh, started writing books as a result of being a blogger and a social media creator. Uh, that irony is not lost on me. But there was an artistry before that. Um, there was there was an expertise that had been you know in hindsight that had been forged over the years of that of artistry as an expression as uh, of artistry as as acts of gaining the knowledge and the capabilities of of performing that artistry in whatever fashion or vehicle it was um, so it wasn't just the expectation of creating and assuming I'd build an audience it was creating and expressing that individuality because I felt number one that it was deep within me, but also because I felt that there was a market for it, uh, and I did all of the work to build that market. So, the expression was just one part. The rest of it was good old fashioned tradesman work of building those markets. Uh, so you do need the discipline of all sides. Now, there are certain disciplines that are unfortunately uh, or fortunately on in the, in in the target sites of of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So, for example. Uh, accountants, um, research professionals, uh, paralegals, uh, radiologists, even uh, those are all uh, those are all there's a list a list of hundreds of jobs that are right in the direct sites of machine learning and automation. Uh, so it, it's I think as parents, it's it's wise for us to understand where we can add value and steer their 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 trades and their skills, uh, but also giving them the the freedom of that expression of that artistry, as long as they understand that there's that entitlement is not part of the equation uh, that creativity and then the work for making that creative uh, celebrated is is part of the whole thing just a good old-fashioned work maintaining that balance thank you you're welcome thank you exactly later later Zev. yeah I, I agree with that man like you know so to one extent, you actually have to become a tradesman before you can become a social media personality. Otherwise, you know, that's the problem. People don't know a trade or don't have a skill yet. They want to be famous. So it creates this toxic <laughs> sort of uh, cycle of, of, of uh, just weird stuff happening on social media. Yeah, I know. I think uh, I worry about that. You know, I have a six and a three year old and I see, I see peers. I have friends who have children that they're investing you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into to try to make them the next uh, internet personality. And <laughs> you know, it's it's crazy. Oh, People are taking seconds out on their houses, and you know, it's uh, look. I, I I don't want to fault anybody for trying, but I think yeah. that there's also this. Uh, I see entitlement way too often. Uh, mm. You know that people try to use the algorithms and the agencies and all of the all of the platforms to make people famous but not necessarily bringing out the talent you know and right. and look every day there's talented people who uh, the world will never know or see because they also don't have the trades or the skills to m help bring that work to us so i think there's just a balance of a lot of work and not all of us got our fair share but at the end of the day if you are happy creating and expressing yourself without being famous then god bless you i mean that's it i uh I'll tell you that sometimes I think my happiest days were when I could just sit by myself and and write a song or play a, a song. And now the enjoyment I get is not just creating or having a platform or any semblance of of popularity, but having the the ability to witness when my work helps somebody. That's that's what that's what keeps me going. Did I love it? And it's the same here. 
So um, th that's about a wrap for today, everyone. Th thank you again for joining. Brian, it's been phenomenal just getting your knowledge and your perspective on all this stuff. Uh, it's a lot to internalize, but you know, I agree with you that um, you know, ignorance is bliss until it's not, kind of like you said. And uh, by the way, if you guys want to connect with Brian Solis, there is a uh, green button uh, below the screen um, where our talking heads are, and you can go to uh, Brian's site, uh, lifescaling.me. And, um, Brian, your, your, your main site is briansolis.com. Yes. So, um, we should probably type that in for everyone to go and check out. I'll drop that into the chat right there too. Cool. Here's the hyperlink. Oh, Brian's got it there too. Awesome. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then follow Brian on, on Twitter and LinkedIn and all those social media platforms. Again, not to say that you should be distracted and following him in all these places, but <laughs> if you truly want to, um, exercise, uh, you know, real, um, sort of, uh, lack of, of distraction or anti-distraction. You, maybe you should just read his book, be single tasked and focus on that and you'll, you'll improve. Okay. So be on the lookout everyone too, for the, uh, replay of this webinar, along with the free digital copy of Brian's book. And with that being said, we're out. Have a great day. Later everyone. <laughs>